All right, so at the top of the hour, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're excited to have you all here today. We appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules during this crazy time and uh, are excited to share a little information with you today. Uh, we're gonna go for an hour and 15 minutes. The first part of the session will be didactic and then we'll uh, move into an open question and answer. So be thinking about those questions and answers as you um, hear everything today and be using chat actively. And then if you're just joining us, if you can go ahead and enter your information into the chat. That's how we're keeping attendance. Next slide. Um, uh, this is just the same information I just said, so just enter that information. We are getting a website up and running where eventually slides and the recording will be posted, but until then we're going to use chat and those who put their emails in there will send you the slides and the recording afterwards. Next slide. A few quick reminders. You came into this meeting muted, so to manage the crowd, we're going to remain muted until people have questions during the second half of the session. The toolbar generally along the bottom of most folks' screens. Um, the mute is on the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, if you run into video freezing, stop your video. In fact, during part of the session, we may ask everybody to stop uh, video if it gets rough, but I think we're good for now. And then just actively use that chat. Next slide. Um, I think I'll skip through this. Uh, next slide. And then just a reminder, this recording is, or the session's being recorded, we'll make it available. So anything you say and do <laughs> will be recorded. Um, and we'll also make the, we're, we'll synthesize the chat and the questions from that and make that available as well. Next slide. Um, Trudy, do you wanna go ahead and, and take over from here? I would love to introduce our team. This is just a few of the individuals and there are many more who contributed to our bringing you this ECHO learning event today. Mike will be presenting our content. Bree Marshall is our genius in the background who does pre-work, during work, and after work that is essential. We'll have folks monitoring the chat and we will be calling upon Sarah with her excellent facilitation skills and synthesis skills um, so this is just a section of our of our team. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So, folks, now that you know just a wee bit about us, um, tell us who you are. Tell us a little bit about who you who you are. What state are you in? And then we'd love to hear the setting in which you're providing services. My name is Richard Rafael. I'm in the state of Nevada. I'm an assistant uh, professor at University of Nevada and Obstetrics and Gynecology. That's uh, so, so awesome. Thank you so much. We were really hoping, you know, I think we, let's see, we have about 80 folks on the line. Um, I'm not sure we have time for individual introductions. Sandra, can we launch the poll maybe? So you're not seeing the poll. Uh, we are okay. not. Let me go ahead. So everybody, we've had some polling issues um, today. So let me go ahead and launch this poll. You should be seeing. Awesome. We see it, Sandra. Thank you. Awesome. I'll give everybody 10 seconds to go ahead and enter your states. And people are still putting figures in there. So I'll go ahead and close it down in three seconds. Two, one. I'm going to stop the polling. I'm going to share the results. That's great, Sandra. We are seeing the results. Um, we, the, we have the majority of folks from Utah, and we have representation from all of the states in our quality improvement organization and other states as well. And if you are from another state, please do put that into chat so we can know what um, states are represented. Let me do one more here. We're really curious to know what settings we have represented today. 
So let me launch this. Are you seeing that poll, Trudy? We are not seeing the poll quite yet, Sandra. Uh, I have others. See I did see, see the poll. You. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. So we'll give it another six seconds. And I'm going to stop the polling and then I'll share the results now. You should be seeing that if you don't let me know and I can share. We can. And I was expecting to see the majority from primary care, but other is actually 34%. So it carries the majority. Please type your setting into chat. We'd love to see the range of practice settings that are represented on our call today. All right, let's go to the next slide. So following the ECHO model, we really don't want this to be didactic heavy. We, we really must provide some background and framework, um, and that's just gonna have to take the place of didactic. Mike will be presenting our didactic information. And then we would love to open the rest of the time up for questions and hear from others who are actually doing telehealth and telemedicine at the front, front line. So today in that didactic section, we'll have a brief introduction to telemedicine. You know, it helps to hear it seven times over, seven different ways. We really wanna hear your needs. We are just starting this, in the, this echo in the first series. We would love to hear what your needs are. I was just on another telemedicine, telehealth webinar, and we heard people wanted to learn more about coding. So please, um, when we get to the Q&A and discussion section, let us know and or put things in chat. Let's get to the next slide. So just a wee quick moment about who we are. So we are the CMS designated quality improvement organization for the states represented on the slide. We actually work across the nation and beyond. We work collaboratively with a lot of stakeholders and partners. That is us, that's Comagine Health, and it is now my pleasure to hand things over to the fearless Mike Silver. Well, thank you, Trudy. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, telemedicine and other virtual healthcare services. This has the uh, potential of creating telecommuting for patients under COVID-19. So what we'll be talking about is options that uh, various providers may have for non-face-to-face -face care. This is Medicare payment policy that we'll be reviewing, uh, changes to standing and, and changes to those payment policies, um, including waivers under COVID-19. Why would you care? Why do we care about this? Why do we care about it so much now? Because non-face-to-face -face care may, uh, when used appropriately, avoid the risk of disease transmission, ensure and improve our access to care as when, when patients don't want to present to, uh, for care, we can still serve them or you can still serve them and uh, expanding your uh, services to include this may help you maintain uh, financial viability uh, in a difficult time. As Trudy said, we're really interested in hearing from you also, how we can help you. We're, we're interested in your experiences. You share your experiences with your colleagues about how you've implemented uh, some of these options and other options. And, and again, um, how we might be able to help you, what other information we might be able to bring forward. So big disclaimer on the front end, we are only talking about Medicare payment policy. And even that is only one consideration. We're talking about uh, providing uh, medical care and related services and, and all those decisions um. about whether or not this is something your practice or your organization wants to go into has to consider not just changes in Medicare payment policy, but is this allowed by your license? Are there, are there state and local regulations? Is this, in your opinion, in your professional judgment, 
something that, that you should be doing that is a benefit to the patients? Does it fit with your business model? All those sorts of things. Um, we, will try to, we will try to point you to resources to understand, but, but you have to use this information in that context. So uh, big picture, again, what are we gonna be talking about today? Three big topics. Who can provide these virtual healthcare services? What are the types of virtual healthcare services? And, and we'll, we'll begin to explore what are the requirements to provide the various types of services that we'll be talking about. I say begin to explore it because there's a lot of details in, these, in, in each of these. We will, we've assembled resources that once you have a sense of what you are interested in learning more about, what might apply to you, that you can explore those resources to, to get a better sense of the requirements um, and uh, the activities to implement this. So, uh, beginning with, so who can, who does this, <laughs> who are we talking about? Who can provide virtual care services? Who does the um, materials that we're gonna review today, who's it applied to? Well, it's a lot of folks. A wide range of clinicians are, eligible to provide virtual care services. Rural health clinics, federally qualified health clinics are qualified. Skilled nursing, hospitals, critical access, you see the others. Um, as we get into this, uh, the idea will be that um, the particular services and the providers, it's going to depend. In some circumstances, uh, a provider can provide the services and others not. So uh, we'll explore some of that together. All right, so the range of virtual healthcare services where healthcare can be provided uh, under Medicare, fee for service, without face to face encounters, include the following that we're going to talk about. Include uh, what they describe as telehealth, and that is where there is interactive two-way audio uh, video uh, communications. E-visits, a relatively new um, uh, Medicare benefit or uh, payment. Uh, and by the way, I'll, I'll mention this, I'll mention this again. In our review, I didn't pick up a related a uh, new service or, or that there was a waiver under COVID-19 for a telephone visit. Uh, we will include that in the resources as we, li we link you to, um, but they have some similarities to these e-visits. There are virtual check-in, which are also potentially phone services, care management that can be provided by phone, interprofessional consultation, uh, remote monitoring and remote evaluation. We're, we're actually not going to talk very much about those last three services, although the resources that we'll point you to provide more information about those. But we'll be mostly talking about the, the top four here, telehealth, e-visits, virtual check-in, and care management. We're gonna take those one at a time and give you a sense of, of what they are and uh, how they are different. We're gonna begin with telehealth. Now, telehealth is a specific in Medicare regulations and payment policy, the, the, it has a specific meaning, telehealth does. Um, and one of, the, one of the meanings, part of what telehealth uh, means when, when Medicare talks about it, in, in most of the cases, um, it means there's an inter interactive audio and vi video to telecommunication. You can see and hear. Um, and let's go with that a little bit more. So these are, uh, th there's, a, there's a specific list of services that are approved uh, Medicare telehealth services. If it's on that list, if it's not on that list, it's not payable as a telehealth service. If it is on the list, then it has to meet other requirements. Those requirements include that it has to be interactive audio and video telecommunications. 
So this is this is not just phone uh, service. There are two. We're going to talk about there are two uh, types of services under telehealth. One is originating sites, that is where the patient is, and the second is the distant site providers, the the clinicians, the professionals that provide the uh, uh, telehealth service. We'll talk about both of them. In general, prior to COVID-19, um, the these benefits were developed and instituted to address patient access issues for rural and health professionals shortage areas. And they were restricted in that manner. Uh, they, they, uh, there was a list of telehealth services, it was a different list, uh, but you could only use them in, in certain conditions. And that was the policy uh, driver behind that. But under uh, COVID-19, uh, there have been waivers that expand the allowed use of telehealth service. Importantly, um, providers can use these waivers to enhance emergency response and reduce the risk from face-to-face -face encounters. We're gonna talk about those those details. So there are some blanket waivers. Again, this is among the, we, we have some additional detail for you in our resource, uh, resource slides coming up. Uh, and I'll describe them generally. So it broadens the, the use of telemedicine services, telehealth services. Um, uh, it makes it easier to do with critical access hospitals, um, uh, allows visits for nursing home residents. Prior to this, prior to the waivers um, that, that still had the rural restriction, under the waivers, it does not have the rural, rural restrictions. Payment policy broadens it or allows out-of-state practitioners, the payment policy allows that. You have to um, check the states that you're operating in to know whether that applies to you. Um, clinicians can render telehealth services from their home. And then this last bullet point is the broadest uh, expansion. So um, you can, telehealth uh, the, is allowed in all areas of the country, including, and the originating site can be the patient's home. Uh, so that's, it's really thrown open the, the options here. Uh, there's a couple other things. Um, so there is some flexibility to uh, waive cost sharing uh, requirements. Again, we'll, we'll point you to more resources for that. There's a note about this. I really wanted to make this available, again, in, our, in the emergency uh, situation. And because of that, um, associated with, with making this available, they're allowing uh, providers uh, to, they're not going to impose penalties of, for violations of HIPAA that occur when there is good faith use of telehealth during the public health emergency. Now, a note on this. Our team has been reviewing this question, and, and we believe that uh, in most situations that providers won't have to use this exception or this, this waiver, that, um, that we should be able to find uh, ways to provide telehealth that are indeed uh, HIPAA compliant. Look for more information on this in future sessions. This is something that even if you've implemented um, uh, something that, that may not be HIPAA compliant in good faith, that in the course of this emergency, you might be able to find that you can revise that um, in the future. SAMHSA has also um, uh, implemented uh, some changes in their requirements. So coming back to the big picture, recall telehealth has distant site pr practitioners and originating uh, uh, sites. So the distant site pr practitioners are those uh, clinicians. These are individuals, these are people. Um, plus I'll get to an exception, another exception. But the types of people that can provide care, um, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical psychologists, social workers, uh, dietitians even, uh, the services are 
uh, they've expanded. The listed approved services um, in association with the, the COVID national emergency. In general, the types of things that are covered under this that you will find on the list include inpatient emergency care, office visits, preventive care, uh, psychotherapy, and some end-stage renal disease care. I'm going to pause just a second on this idea of, of preventive care. It's our understanding that, um, that uh, practices and folks have been responding to this emergency already, uh, that we've recognized the need to do telehealth or related services just to respond to uh, patient demand and, and to uh, provide necessary care. If, if one finds or if a practice finds that you have excess capacity, that is that we're not providing as many face-to-face -face or even phone-based visits, as we used to, and we have, we still want to provide or take care of our patients. Preventive care is something that uh, we can do. We don't have to wait for patients to, to call. Uh, if you have folks, you can, you can start getting that in order as well. Um, and this can provide the front end. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, chronic care management a little later on. That type of, of uh, reaching out to patients, ensuring that uh, that they're okay, that they're, uh, the plans you made for them are still appropriate during uh, this time. Um, that's the sort of thing you can do under telehealth. Um, what else do we note? Uh, telehealth substitutes directly for in-person encounter and is paid for under the physician fee schedule. There is also, and this is important, I think for a number of folks on the line, um, they have added, uh, uh, federally qualified health centers and rural health centers as distant site providers in this case. That's a new waiver or expansion of, of the service. So that's who can provide um, the, the telehealth. That's a distant site. There's also, it takes two to tango, right? Uh, in telehealth, there's a distant site and there's a originating site. Now, there are, the COVID-19 waiver has expanded the originating sites to include places where, where that were previously excluded from this. Urban locations, um, uh, authorized sites, and then importantly, the patient's homes. So um, authorized originating sites now in any, whether it's rural or not, include uh, the settings you see there. Uh, physician offices, hospitals, critical access hospitals, skilled nursing facilities. And um, the service being provided here is there, there's an originating site uh, facility fee that is available for these authorized sites providing access to the telecommunication system. Um, it's not, or I wouldn't describe it as a rich uh, fee, but it is a fee. Uh, it's about um, and again, we're pointing you to more information, but it's about $25, maybe a little bit more, depending on your geography and things like that. So, um, okay, so that was telehealth. Recall the telehealth interactive two-way audio-visual communication. Now we're going to talk about a different um, uh, service or a different type of service, e-visits. E-visits themselves, These are, this is online. If you have a, a patient portal, you have a way for patients to communicate with you digitally. Uh, there are uh, payments available for this as well. And again, this is where I'm just gonna mention and we'll include it in the resources. There's a similar waiver for um, a telephone visit that looks a lot like the, the structure of the of the um, service uh, looks a lot like the e-visits, but it's conducted over the phone instead. Okay, so what is an e-visit? It's a relatively new uh, Medicare service or benefit. Um, and uh, this is a, a service that can be provided by the, the same uh, uh, types of providers that can do evaluation and management billing as physicians and non-physicians practitioners, and also 
and there's separate CPTs or separate payments for this, uh, qualified uh, non-physician healthcare professionals also provide e-visits and the telephone service as well. It, it's structured similarly. So our physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, clinical psychologists, folks like that. The, the technology required here uh, is it, it can be online through the patient portal, that sort of thing, if you have that set up already. Um, the services are under normal circumstances. It requires a, a established patients. Uh, the patient initiates the service and it has to substitute. It, it can't result in a uh, in-person visit. Um, so, uh, and this is cumulative time over seven days. It's time-based. Uh, let's see, what are I, oh, oh, and the waiver, they are not going to enforce the established patient requirement. So, okay, so that's the e-visit. Here's the virtual check-in, which is not, not quite the same. So, a uh, virtual check-in, um, the, 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 there's a request for services the patient can call, and the reply from the provider can be over the phone or by secure text or by other mechanisms, email portal. Um, so again, this does not require interactive two-way audio video communications and therefore it's not a telehealth service. So uh, who can provide this? Again, it's the ENM billing el eligible uh, providers, physicians and non-physician practitioners. Established patients, again, the, uh, the established part is waived, uh, and they contact the provider, um, and the provider responds in some manner. The service is described as five to 10 minutes of medical discussion, not related to last visit or not leading to a subsequent visit. For these services, I might have forgot it on the last, uh, one, but patients have to consent to receive these um, because there's there's cost there may be cost sharing involved. Um, these uh, the virtual check in the national payment amount I didn't mention this on the last one. I'm going to actually I have to backtrack a little bit. So the national payment amount for a virtual check in again it's five to ten minutes of service of uh, uh, is fourteen dollars about fourteen dollars again that'll be uh, a little different based on your uh, geography and things like that. Going back, now I'm backtracking to the e-visit. I'll give you an example. The, the, uh, there's a code for 11 to 20 minutes by a E&M uh, eligible provider, and the national payment amount for that non-facility is $31. It's about $31. It'll be different depending on so you can contrast those. And again, there's more information on this. So we've talked about telehealth, we've talked about virtual visits and e-visits, and now we're gonna talk about care management services. These aren't new, these aren't particularly, um, well, there's some changes, there's some recent updates. Most of this is not, uh, uh, most of this information is not changed by um, policy did not have to get updated in response to uh, COVID-19, um, but these have, in our monitoring, we've seen care management as, as potentially underutilized, and this might be something uh, particularly important to revisit in this time. So we'll review what that looks like. The, the technology um, is, on this is no more than, and can, it could be used a variety of technology, but it requires no more than the phone. And one important thing that we wanted to highlight here on the care manager management services is that these are services that um, are provided by providers themselves and by the clinical staff that they supervise. So if you have clinical staff who two months ago, I kept very busy um, uh, helping, assisting with face-to-face -face services that now find themselves with 
less of that time, uh, less, uh, less of their time filled up with that, they may be able to contribute a great deal of value for the patients and, um, and contribute uh, to uh, maintain revenue through these activities if you haven't done it before. So overview of care management. Uh, the, the, the Medicare Chronic Care Management um, Services and Codes have uh, began in uh, 2015, and they've been enhancing them ever since then. Chronic Care Management is management of, of all care for patients with two or more chronic conditions. Um, they're expected to last at least 12 months or so. Um, now these conditions place the patient at significant risk. Um, and in order to, to conduct chronic care management, a uh, provider develops a comprehensive care plan and revises it, monitors it uh, as appropriate. And this is typically, but, but certainly not exclusively, primary care. Um, there are, uh, very, there, we've seen um, good use of this by other specialties. There's also beyond this, and this was uh, instituted to address a concern that, that had been expressed with the chronic care management, a new code for, it was brand new in 2020, called Principal Care Management. And this is comprehensive care management services for single high-risk disease. So this isn't restricted on specialty. Technically, neither is chronic care management. Neither one of them is actually restricted to specialty. Um, but uh, Medicare or CMS believes that uh, principal care management will be uh, mostly billed by specialists, but again, it's not restricted. Um, it requires uh, providers to document their coordination with other practitioners. So the way that these are structured, these are time-based codes, so you have to count time. But uh, the time provided by the provider themselves and the clinical staff that they supervise both count toward this and it's cumulative over the course of a month. For the chronic care management, I've talked about most of this. So the eligible providers are listed there, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, certified nurse midwives, and clinical nurse specialists. Their time providing these services can count or chronic care management, as can the time of their clinical staff under their direction. Um, and the types of things are chronic care management, this is taking care of people in between visits. So there is an initiating visit where you set up a comprehensive care plan. Uh, you must have uh, EHR technology. And then the other elements is you have to provide 24 access, 24 seven access to someone who can, who can access a medical record, provide continuity of care, manage care transitions, manage or help the, uh, with home and community-based care coordination and enhance communication. So there's, a, there's in the payment for this, there is a, a higher level of payment where there's higher uh, medical decision complexity. And this requires verbal consent as well. Now you can imagine that if our plan, if your plan in January was that, well, patient, patients will come back and we'll check on them and we'll manage them in that manner through through face-to-face -face encounters. Well, the, for various reasons, uh, the patient doesn't want it, you might not want it. Should we be enhancing our chronic care management would be a, a question. I'll give you an idea about the approximate payments. So in the, what's called the non-complex uh, chronic care management, which includes clinical staff time, the national payment amount for non-facilities is about $40 for 20 minutes. For the complex um, uh, chronic care management, again, that involves um, clinical staff, 60 minutes um, pays about $90 uh, for the national payment amount. And there are higher payments when the provider, when the, for codes that uh, uh, use the, uh, the provider's personal time exclusively. Principal care management is similar to chronic care management. Um, 
except that um, it is, well, some exceptions are that the, it's intended for management of a single high risk disease. You don't have to document that they have two chronic diseases. Um, and there are, um, there's an expectation that the, because this will be used or there's an expectation this is used by specialists, there's also an expectation that you will coordinate with other providers, including primary care providers. This is again, time-based um, coding. And there's a separate code for when the uh, provider themselves provides a service as uh, separate from the clinical staff time. For the provider's time, about 30, uh, 30 minutes, um, the national payment amount is about $90. For the clinical staff time, for 30 minutes, the national payment amount is uh, just under $40. So, been with a whirlwind introduction to uh, the types of virtual care service. We talked about um, uh, the telehealth, which involves the interactive two-way audio and video, and a number of services that can be provided in other using other technologies, um, uh, technologies in some cases, no more sophisticated than the telephone. Uh, we think that these will um, provide uh, opportunities for to enhance infection control and maintain services uh, during the time of this national emergency. So, um, and oh, and we got bun uh, tons of resources for you. If you, um, uh, you request the um, uh, slides from us, you'll be able to look these up directly. These are also included in our um, website that I'll, um, I think we'll have in just a moment. So you'll be able to find that um, on, on all the things that we've talked about so far and in fact more. So all of this and more is available, can be found on our telemedicine and virtual services resource website. And uh, for more, uh, if you have other requests, we are available at our telehelp desk. Uh, and you can see that telehealth help, telehelp at imagine.org. Um, and that takes us to, <laughs> the place where you're, you will have questions that I probably won't be able to answer, but uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we, we, will be, um, we will also be opening this up for broader discussion, but we wanted to pause before we dove into that with uh, any, any questions, the things that I left out. This is the time for that. Oh, and- Trudy, would I, you like me to go ahead and ask Mike some questions? This is Sarah Wolsey. Sarah, I would like to start off with a really important question that we have debated internally and came up over and over in the chat. So Mike, you recently dove into the interim final rule about whether phone only can or cannot be used specifically for the Medicare telehealth services. Um, I would love if you could share your findings and the final conclusion on on that. Oh, okay, and th thank you. And this is um, this has been a tricky one because there's uh, there's the final rule itself, and then there's there's commentary from PMS and others uh, describing what's in that final rule. Our assessment, our read of this, is that. Two things happen. I mean, a couple things happen. One, in the interim final rule, um, they, they they modified, they created waivers around the use of telehealth. A lot of waivers around the use of telehealth. Uh, they also, but but what they did not waive is the requirement for our read is what they did not waive is the requirement for um, uh, interactive two-way audio-visual communication. For it to be a telehealth service, it has to have that, that characteristic. There was another, but in that interim final rule, separate from that, they, um, 
they opened up, actually there were existing CPT codes, Medicare didn't pay for telephone services. They opened those up and that's, and, and by the way, that's the, the thing I kept uh, uh, saying that I'd left out. We didn't, I don't have that, we didn't have that in the slides properly, but you'll find more of that on the website. So there's a new, there's a, a waiver that, that allowed or expanded the use of telephone services, but it is separate from telehealth. It's not actually telehealth proper. And you will find that like a, a key distinction there is telehealth pays exactly the same. It's the, it's the same as, uh, as if the service was face-to-face. -face. These other the telephone support service, we don't have a um, uh, payment amount on that currently, but it's going to be less. That's the, the, the payment um, uh, policy principle that they follow. Does that help? I hope that got to that. Um, hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, thank you. Yes, hi. Um, I, um, I am still troubled by, um, I guess I'm not convinced because um, for two reasons. One is Medicare clearly stated that they want to make care available, remote care available to as many people as possible, removing any and all barriers. Hence, no HIPAA, you know, they waived HIPAA, they uh, waived the origination site. And uh, the truth is that a lot of Medicare beneficiaries have n are remarkably bad at technology don't have smartphones, don't know how to, or do have them, don't know how to operate them. And so, um, first of all, the interpretation that audio only is not telehealth is inconsistent with the spirit of what Medicare, CMS has been saying. And secondly, it's also inconsistent with their own interpretation of their own rule, where under the heading, further promote telehealth, they said, providers can evaluate beneficiaries who have audio phones only. They play the telehealth in their own heading. And as you know, they've been separating telehealth from virtual check-ins. So to me, that their own interpretation, um, putting audio only under the telehealth and their general intention that they've always stated um, to access, move barriers to access, combined with what we all know, which is Medicare beneficiaries are particularly troubled when it comes to video, tells me that very aggressive interpretation that is not really consistent and led financially not sustainable either. So I pre this is exactly the same uh, questions that our team has been wrestling with. And, and I think that other members of my team and you both agree that they um, that there may be an a reasonable interpretation and correct interpretation other than the one that I provided. I would I would encourage you to go through that work yourself. If you're if you're um, uh, if you're contemplating uh, submitting claims for telephone only services as tele health services. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to, to check that for yourself. The, I can share my interpretation. I can, I can also share that uh, uh, there was debate am, uh, among our team. Um, and, I, and I couldn't, for our purposes, I couldn't in good faith tell people that, our, that my interpretation of the rule allowed for that, because I don't think it does. So, th but thank you for bringing that forward. Um, we, will, we will monitor that. We will try to uh, get a definitive uh, position unless, but if you believe that, that what you have is a definitive position, then uh, you must act on that. I would also add that in Oregon, where we are, our Medicaid um, made a very clear statement that audio only is now included in the telehealth definition. So they seconded that interpretation and put it in place for Medicaid. So that get, gives us kind of more confidence in our interpretation. But I hear you that it's vague and that each, uh, probably each system and each clinic might have to make their own determination. Yes, thank you. 
Um, great. And, you know, I have to say that I, I wanted Mike to include the phones only in the slides and um, because I saw exactly the same thing that you said, but when we really dove into it, we, you know, when we read that interim final rule, that's really the source of truth. And they pretty clearly said that, yes, you can use FaceTime or phones for the audio visual, but they were, it, it's interesting to check their language. So as you sort that out, we encourage you to check the final rule. So Mike, um, Sarah, sent a chat in to me and asked whether, based on some of the questions in chat, whether you could flip back to that summary slide and possibly share some examples of what would be an e-visit versus what would be a virtual check-in. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting. E-visit can literally be e-visit. The whole thing can be, um, it's in fact, it's intended to be um, uh, through a patient portal or some other mechanisms. The actual payment structures are a little bit different as well. E-visits are, are um, um, I'll go up a little bit more. E-visits are time-based. So uh, there's, a, there's a payment level for cumulative over seven days. So you don't have to do it all in one session at the keyboard. Uh, there's a payment level for five to 10 minutes of effort, 11 to 20, 21 minutes plus. And the national payment amounts range from uh, about $15 for the lowest end to $50 at the highest end. For the virtual check-in, typically over the phone, or it's, it, it's anticipated to be over the phone, there's only one level of service, five to 10 minutes, and it pays national payment amount for non-facility currently is $14.80. So, um, depends on the, in, in some cases, it, de it might depend on the level of service you're providing uh, more than on the, um, in some cases, the technology that's being used. Uh, Mike, I would like to add here the most common question which comes when it says patient uh, initiated a, a, a visit. So we have heard a lot of questions. What does that mean? Does patient have to call in first? A good example would be, say, for example, if a patient is on your schedule and for some reason you are not, uh, you have, you have, you're not seeing patients on site, that would consider as a patient initiated and yeah. then you can call in for patient to see if you can do the virtual check-in. But for all these visits, it's very important to take the consent and document that. Yes, yes, thank you for clarifying that. Also, it is allowed to um, inform, you are allowed to inform your patients that now you offer this service. It can still be patient initiated and say, let you know during this time, we're going to be providing e-visits, virtual check-in, that's allowable as well, without violating that patient initiated um, uh, requirement. So so, Mike, just to expand on that further, and I appreciate um, Seema's question. So, a telehealth visit would really replace something that would be a face-to-face -face typical visit, and the documentation would be similar. An e-visit might be something where you're going back and forth with a patient-reported data and maybe altering an insulin regimen or titrating a, an antidepressant, for example, and that's an, uh, they send you a message, you respond, they change something, yes. go back and forth. And then that virtual check-in is really that brief check-in by phone, largely, could also be chosen to be a, a televisit, but really might want to bump that up in billing, uh, but a real brief communication that's done to follow up on something or clarify something. Right. Um, and you can now bill for that where many of us might have done that and not billed. Would that right. be accurate, Mike? I think that, that, thank you so much. That's a, that's a, that's well, a good, yeah. um, good one, detail elaboration. Hi, Seema. Yeah, no, one thing for e-visit because it's a accumulative time over seven days. So, uh, you have to really figure out who and how you are going to keep track of the time. So something which could be very challenging. So that's why e-visits are not very popular as much as virtual visits or telemedicine, which is audio and visual combination. Good, excellent point. Uh, the uh, telephone service that we didn't talk that I didn't get on the slides that has the same characteristics. So 
for some of the stuff, and then care management, uh, again, you have to figure out how to track time. Uh, in fact, multiple uh, people's time uh, in some cases. Mike, we had a very and, good and question. Just a, oh, a go ahead, quick Jay. Tip yep. on, a quick tip on keeping track of time. So a lot of EHRs allow an electronic signature. So for example, in GE Centricity, you can do dot sign and it inserts your time date stamp. So if you start your call or you start your work, um, you document and then you do that second time stamp. At the very least, you can know what your start and stop time are. There are other EHRs that track that time, like ECW, for example. They do that for chronic care management, but not necessarily for the e-visit. So as we mentioned, it's a challenge. Back to you, Sarah. That's excellent. Yes. And uh, we welcome folks to share ideas of how they're tracking time. Uh, feel, feel free to put that into the chat. And that may be a topic for, for the future, Trudy, is to get people, you know, really talking about that. Um, Mike, we had a process question. Uh, a couple of things. People are interested in how they physically will look, and this may be for some of our, our folks in the field, um, document and see the video at the same time. And if anyone has uh, successes with that, that was a question. The other process question is folks that do things that are like integrated behavioral health visits, where they are gonna have a couple providers warm handoffs with a patient or maybe a brief time of co-visiting. And if anybody has suggestions on those process ways to, to manage the technology and give the patient the best experience. So any, any feedback on that is welcome. Actually, Sarah, I'm going to ask that we hang on to that and come back to that in a moment. We wanted to actually turn to um, getting some more input, exactly this type of input, if folks have ideas about that uh, from the group. So we, we had planned to move in that direction, and I'm going to move us on. So we have a couple more polls. I we want to get a sense of where people are at, and then we will be turning to those, uh, those types of questions and that type of discussion. So we're interested in, in where you're at now. Uh, which of these services that we've been talking about are you currently using? Actually, I think I've taken over Trudy's role. Trudy was supposed to do this, <laughs> but I got us there. No, good, good. So, so we'll, we've launched the poll. Can you see that, Mike? Yes. Okay, awesome. We'll give it about uh, 15 more seconds for those who can see the poll, if you'll quickly um, note which of these services you're currently using. Check any and all that apply. And they're listed there. Uh, telehealth, interactive two-way audio and video, e-visits, online digital patient portal, virtual check-in, brief communication such as the phone, care management follow-up, coordination of the phone, interprofessional consultation, phone internet EHR, and remote physio physiologic monitoring and remote evaluation. And I read those because those answers will be what you'll be looking at for the following questions as well. Wow. Very nice. We see that, uh, Sandra. And um, far and away, people are engaging in the telehealth interactive two-way audio and video. Supplanting, I think, a lot of those in-person visits, which is awesome. A lot are doing the virtual check-ins and doing care management, which I think is really great, especially for your high-risk patients, and it provides an additional source of revenue. And it also utilizes staff who would ordinarily be doing on-site duties to provide the care management support for um, patients who qualify. So we have a couple more. Let me do this next one. This next one, that one was which ones you're currently providing. This next one is which ones are you thinking of adding or expanding. Are y'all seeing that? I am not. Not yet, no. We've had glitches with this today. So I'm gonna stop that and then I'm gonna try it one more time. Do you see it now? No. Nope. All right. So, uh, Shannon, if you. Oh. This is the same poll. So yeah. this is currently using. So we'll get rid of that. 
And if we can't sort this out, Sandra, let's move to our facilitated discussion and Q&A. Yeah, okay, I this, agree. We got it. This is uh, actually the one I was uh, thinking, which of these are you thinking of adding or expanding? So it's the same list, uh, but uh, things that, that you're, you might be adding or expanding. Okay, we'll give this five more seconds. We're seeing the answers rolling in. They're still rolling in, so, so we'll give it another minute. Uh, okay, I'm gonna end polling in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and sharing the results. Are you seeing the results? Oh. We see it and it sounds like people are really interested in getting going with remote physiologic monitoring. And I will say that that's one of the ones that CMS has not created guidance documents on. So if you wanna know what to do, you're kind of stuck with going back to the final rule, um, which not a lot of people like to do. So we are trying to get those details for those virtual and remote services that are not readily available through CMS guidance. We will do the sorting through the final rules and synthesize and package the information on the website for you. Okay, and this one is, uh, what do you want to, what would you like to learn more about? Things that we might be able to help you with or uh, range. Um, so what are your questions here? Yeah, and be sure to, to answer this one uh, if you've been pausing, because this is where we can use this information to be able to develop future uh, sessions. Give it five more seconds. And people are still answering, so I'm hesitant to cut it off, but I'm gonna cut it off now and share the results. And again, remote physiologic monitoring shows up as um, a popular topic as well as care management. I think we should all be doing that. And it's a, it's a mixed bag. I think that we could put some content around all of these for an upcoming ECHO. Thank you so much for taking the time to do all three of those polling questions. All right, Sarah, can you pose that question that we kind of put on pause again? Absolutely. So um, uh, we are lucky there are some folks that have been responding to the process question, a couple of process questions. So Mike, two things. One is just addressing um, how you would do a coordinated visit with team-based care and some of the technologies that, that one might use to have more than one provider caring for a patient like we would physically in an office. And one person mentioned they're using Zoom Health and just like the room that we're in today, it looks like multiple providers could be in the same place or a warm handoff could occur sort of a face-to-face. -face. Um, I would love to hear if other folks have ways that they're doing uh, an integrated visit or, or warm handoff um, that they'd like to chat or comment and any of our experts on the on the line please share. So Sarah if, if, um, if you have experience with that if you have something to share you can take yourself off mute or I think uh, 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 contribute to chat, but uh, go ahead and take yourself off mute if you're doing this sort of coordinated team-based care using uh, uh, virtual technology. Hello, my name is Camille. I'm a um, social worker that's doing integrated behavioral health. So this was a question that I had posed. We are using Zoom um, to do these visits. The challenge that we have found is that if we have the provider and the, the behavioral health consultant and if anyone else is involved in the visit, um, many times when we're doing it in the clinic, the um, other team members will continue to work with the patient while the physician moves on to another patient, which is one of the kind of benefits. However, they can't utilize their Zoom account 
if there's one already, you know, if like I'm using it as a BHC um, until I'm done. So without having to make the patient switch to a different Zoom meeting, that's the flow that, that I'm struggling with and how to do that. So we've had to just kind of bounce back and forth between different accounts. Yeah, so I can take this question about Zoom, yeah. So which platform are you trying, Zoom Health or Zoom Basic? Um, Zoom Basic, we do have some providers with the right. pro account and right. we've been trying it with that too, but haven't quite figured out how to make right. that work anymore. Yeah, better. yeah. So there are a few things. Uh, Zoom is the most basic option, the cheapest possible options. And for team-based, uh, Zoom Health has a, a better technology, which has a virtual waiting room. What that means is like if a provider is still with a patient in the other call, a uh, patient can wait in the waiting room. But uh, as so th that obviously that involves some cost uh, with Zoom Health. And it's, uh, it, it doesn't take that much time to register. Every provider gets their own link with that. Uh, if you're really looking for a team-based care, have you considered of using any kind of vendors? The, 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 the vendors are a little bit expensive, but for team-based care, the way the kind of technology they have, uh, it uh, really helps to coordinate the care. Uh, it's uh, not all the not all the vendors are integrated in EMR, but some of them are integrated. Uh, one other thing with Epic, Zoom uh, is integrated in Epic. I don't know which EMR you have, so it really depends how much investment you are willing to do in this in the technology. Uh, there are a few platforms like Doxy.me and some others which have a basic package, uh, which is a lot more uh, uh, physician and patient friendly. So something like that, if you want to try out. Okay, thank you. Seema, I just want to throw something out. I know that there are breakout rooms in some of the basic Zoom functions. And I would not say that it would work, but that could be a possible way to, um, to deal with the, the issue that was described of, of the co-visit. So that's just something I would say, have, have somebody who's technologically savvy consider looking at the breakout room. Um, Zoom, regular Zoom is not HIPAA compliant. Um, and so that's just something for folks to be aware of. And uh, there's a mention here, is anyone moving away from Zoom due to security issues? We encourage folks to maximally secure any platform they're using, even with the lack of HIPAA compliance, you're gonna wanna um, you right. know, have a password protected entry for patients, et cetera, at the most basic level. Yeah, Zoom is being investigated for some kind of breach. This morning I saw in the news that Google has come up with some kind of telehealth um, module. I haven't been able to look into it a lot, but um, looks like a lot of, uh, and Google is op offering for free. So something more to look into it. Just, uh, just briefly, Camille, I wanted to thank you for bringing that up in our in, the, in our review of services, we, we didn't include that uh, psychiatric or the coordinated care model. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up, the, the team-based uh, care model. So. Just another technical process question that came up was just physically how to, to use the platform and maintain that connection to patients. So again, welcome, um, Mike, if you want to facilitate folks using their voice, there's one uh, gentleman uh, person, uh, Primary Care Echo is describing their use of a Mac. Maybe you want to unmute my Primary Care Echo and describe your solution. All right. <clears throat> what I usually do is I'll uh, fire up our EMR system using uh, Microsoft Desktop Remote, um, and I'll then open up my Zoom session. And what that does with the Microsoft Desktop Remote is you can swipe left or right uh, so that you're looking at your monitor the whole time where the camera is and the patient uh, doesn't see your eyes diverting either to a secondary screen or some other place in the process of doing that and that works very fluidly with that. I don't know that that's a, something that can be done 
with a Microsoft system simply because it doesn't have to go through the adapter to use the uh, EMR, but uh, just something we happen to notice with most of our clinicians who do use Mac laptops. Thank you. Mike, one question that came up, and it may be something we deal with in a future session, is billing for, for televisits, e-visits, and the um, uh, virtual, virtual check-ins. Uh, is there a future plan to talk about billing? Well, I'm going to check with uh, Trudy. I think some of the resources that we've assembled uh, get at some of those issues, at least. Yes, you should find a little bit of billing information like codes and what the national non-facility price is. Um, we also have our help desk. Um, I, uh, SEMA has been working with practices as they go between the practices and the MAC, the Medicare, I can't remember what MAC stands for, um, <laughs> to get additional information. Um, I'm curious what the billing questions are. So is it, what are the codes? What is the reimbursement? What are, uh, you know, what place of service? What modifier we need? You know, are those the type of billing questions people have? Yeah. Um, but we yeah. have most of that on our website. So they're, they're fairly general. We're also getting questions specific to like a rural health center. Um, so again, I think some of those, um, those tools that Trudy mentioned, um, are on the, the, the web page, and we welcome those specific questions to the telehealth uh, listserv as well. So you want to, to get some personalized technical assistance there. Um, someone showed interested in remote patient monitoring. Uh, would that person be able to talk what exactly they are looking for? Are they looking for how to bill for it, the workflows, vendors, what kind of questions do they have? You know, Seema, I think that was our poll question where we were actually asking folks what they'd like to advance into. Okay. And I don't think we got specific on that. Okay. Yeah. If anyone has specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer on remote patient monitoring. I have worked with practices to uh, implement those. Okay. There's also a question. Sarah, we heard a, Go ahead. Yep. We heard a, a question about the logistics of typing your notes and um, also keeping eye contact with the patients. And we talked to a clinic about this and I asked that question, it was a behavioral health um, clinic and they were doing telemedicine and they're doing it successfully. They're actually very generous and are happy to share their experience as well. Um, so I asked them, I said, what about not having eye contact? So the camera is on your face, but even if you have a second screen, which is a challenge if you don't have a second screen, and you're over here typing, how does the patient know that you're not like just typing an email to somebody because you're madly typing away and not having eye contact with them? And their response was very interesting. They said, our patients are used to having their doctors type as they conduct the visit. But I, you know, I don't think that's going to be the case for everyone, especially because you've lost this personal uh, piece. You're no longer face to face. So I do think a reasonable best practice is to tell the patient what you're doing and say, you know, I may not be having eye contact with you. I'm not looking at the camera. It's because I am documenting and typing as you talk because I want to be sure that I capture all of the information that you're giving me. Um, but if you don't have two, if you don't have two screens, it's really a challenge. And we've heard this um, problem come up before. Um, we uh, talked to one practice that is to overcome this, what they're, what they're gonna have is their MA is gonna be scribing. So the MA joins the call as well, and the MA doesn't have to be in the same room. The MA can just join the Zoom, and the MA, who's now maybe not doing rooming and all those kinds of other things, acts as the scribe for the clinician. I thought that was an awesome solution. That's a great, that's great, Trudy. 
wanted to just um, kind of on that same sort of technology and hands-on, folks are asking about things, you know, recording blood pressures, recording metrics that, that have to be in office, like a weight or a blood pressure. Are there, are there ways that folks are handling that documentation, um, you know, from patient report? Are they using other sources? Are they um, having a, a non-contact way to do that during the COVID-19? So any, uh, any comments or thoughts on physical exam pieces or data pieces that are important to our documentation for visits. And before our folks from Comagine Health answer, is there anyone on the line that is doing this and has a solution? So Jessica, um, are you um, able to talk a little bit more about what you're doing for your virtual OB visits? Sure, let me make my face come back on. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm here at the University of Utah and we are seeing, we, we've had a program here for a while for um, being able to provide OB virtual visits. So I'm actually um, one of the nurse practitioners here. And so I'm, I'm not the expert. I'm helping with our team at this moment. So um, there's going to be other people here at our university that could answer questions better than me. But I just want to let you know, our patients do have access through Epic where they log in. And then the MA gets their um, weight and vitals, and then we are able to see them uh, with a video through the EPIC system. But again, I'm, I'm, my uh, challenge this week has been to try to do this from home. And so we realized that the system we have required the use of an iPad. So I was able to get that set up finally. But So it's just one thing. Um, working with that system, but it, our patients love it. Um, they're able to stay home where they're safe. Um, and this is something I think we are now using that same technology to expand to our gynecology patients. So not just our OB patients, but it's mainly the physiologic um, fetal heart tones that we're doing uh, with the monitoring. That's really great. Right. And for COVID. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Christina Edwards at First Choice House Calls. I had uh, something to contribute to the vital signs. Great, Christina. We'd love to hear it. Um, so, I mean, we do house calls. We're a mobile physician's office. Uh, a lot of our patients are in assisted living facilities, independent living facilities. So we do utilize that, those facility staff to take our vitals and fax them over to us prior to the televisit, um, like the morning of. Uh, we also coordinate with if the patient's in their own home, um, if they're getting home health services uh, from a home health company or something, we'll coordinate with those nurses who are going out to see them and have them record vitals for us. If the patient doesn't have their own equipment in which then they could, you know, take their own set of vitals and just tell us what they are. That's great. And Christina, you're also using Scribes for telehealth? Yes. Yes, our Scribes are on the call so that they can document the conversation um, while the provider is uh, talking to them. Mm -hmm. Judy, I think we All have right. to move to wrap up. Okay. All, All right. right. Just quick thing, because of COVID-19, uh, physical examination, how to document has come quite a lot. This is more like the, the visit is more based on time and medical decision making. So it's level one and two kind of visits. Uh, I'm not a, a coder or a, um, but uh, so for time being, that has changed just for this pandemic time. So. Uh, kind of visit to keep in mind and the, the billing is based more on time. All right. Excellent. All right, Sandra. Um, so 
We have echo, a lot of echo programs going on in our region and beyond. And can you take us to our last slide, please, Sandra? Yep. So we just want to do a big shout out to our friends in our echo programs in our states. There are a lot of different echo programs. These folks have been instrumental in helping. Um, so we want to just do a shout out and a note of appreciation to them. Uh, next slide. And then just a quick wrap up. Uh, we will keep you posted on the next session. We have, do we have a date yet, Trudy, Mike? We have a tentative date of April 22nd for an echo around nursing home. All right. And so we'll keep people posted on that. Um, we will email out the slides and the link to the recording. And we'll also let you know, we'll, in the message of the email, we'll let you know where the website is again so that you'll know where to find things in the future. If you have questions, we'd love to help however we can. Trudy's contact information is on there. Uh, so we just really appreciate everybody's time, everybody's involvement, appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Sandra, for wrapping us up. And thank you to all who stayed on the line. It was great. The questions were awesome and the conversation was even better. So thank you so much. Yep, thank you.